My name is Petter Janssen, or Peter in English, and I'm a professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. I'm now going to give an introduction to the course uh, on water, sanitation and health in the Arctic. And um, when we talk about the Arctic, we talk about the very northernmost area on the globe. And you can see the red line there, that's a, a border where you have uh, AMAP or uh, international research programs for the Arctic. And the climate in the Arctic is uh, varying around the, the circle of the North Pole. In Norway, and you see Tromsø on this map, we have warmer climate than we have, for instance, at the same latitude over in Prudhoe Bay in uh, Alaska. That's due to warm currents coming up along the Norwegian coast from the Gulf of Mexico. We have extremely cold climate and the coldest climate almost on the globe in this area. And uh, this picture shows uh, Sisimit in Greenland, that's on the polar circle. What characterizes this is among other things, we have a low biological diversity. And that of course, again, uh, transfers into the degradation of pollutants, for instance, it's slower. And uh, biology is also more vulnerable. So um, we have lower reaction rates, chemical and biolog biological processes. So we have to be uh, especially careful what we do up here. We do have um, global warming. And this is uh, mean annual temperatures on the globe. And they are going up as this curves from Svalbard, the island north of Norway shows. And particularly in the last years, it has been accelerating. This is quite alarming because the ice cap is uh, retreating, it's becoming smaller. Although we had uh, an expansion again this last winter, that's part of the uh, general um, variations in nature. This may be a correct picture some years into the future. I hope not, but we do see very large changes, especially in the north. It's more evident there than it's further south. So what is the problem when we discharge wastewater in these areas? It's few people, it's huge oceans, so is it a problem? For instance, Greenland, the world's biggest island, it has uh, an ice-free area that equals the land of Norway, the area of Norway. And in Greenland, it's only 55,000 people. In Norway, it's 5.5 million, and we are sparsely populated. So. What is the problem? I mean, it's so few people. If we discharge directly into the sea, as many people do today and have been doing also in Norway, does it matter? The city of Tromsø has 75,000 people. It's at 69 degrees north. They only have mechanical treatment. And it has been shown that, for instance, Pharmaceutical residues, uh, organic chemicals that act as endocrine disruptors have affected sea organisms outside Tromsø. And this is also shown elsewhere in the world. So we have to be careful with some of our discharges. Maybe the nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, and of course the organic matter and suspended solids that are the <coughs> normal constituents that we remove from wastewater. Maybe that doesn't matter so much up here because the oceans are so big and the people aren't very many. But when it comes to, well, particles, they may contain um, antibiotic resistant microorganisms attached to them, or uh, we can have organic micropollutants that is coming from our personal care products, it's coming from pharmaceutical residues and their metabolites that go into the sewer. 
some years back there was a warning on this popular uh, spread that we had have on bread in Norway it's still for sale it's very good made from cod liver and cod roe I like it a lot but it was a warning not to be consumed by pregnant women and that was because of the contaminants PCBs and other uh, organic micropollutants but after some time the warning was taken away and I've heard it was considered that the advantages or the of having a lot of omega-3 and other good constituents was outweighing the negative side of having the chemicals. My colleague Roland Kallenborn is working on pollutants in the north and he tells me that if you for instance analyzed the fat of a polar bear, whale grass, mink uh, or the yeah, whales, it's minky whale, the carnivores, it's uh, you find all kind of different organic chemicals at sometimes alarming levels and I've also heard that the polar bears are having some reproductive uh, problems. So what is it that's a problem? I don't think the nutrients, not the organic matter, maybe particles sometimes, that can contain antibiotic resistant microorganisms that can be transferred to, uh, to other organisms and, and hamper life. And then we have the organic micropollutants, SP, PCPs, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. We have to be careful with them. In Sweden, they have a large program called Advanced Wastewater Treatment, where they're looking into how can we remove this one. And the first treatment plant in Sweden was opened this winter, where they actually remove them. But that's costly. It's going to cost us a lot to, to remove these ones, at least in traditional conventional treatment systems. We also face other challenges. Many poor communities are found in Greenland, and in Alaska, Northern Canada, and Russia, Russia especially. They don't have our, or the normal standard of toilets. They might have a so-called honey bucket inside the home where they collect all the, their excreta in a bucket lined with a plastic bag. It smells. It also poses health risk to have all these feces uh, in your home and it also affects their dignity. They don't feel proud of having such a toilet. They would like to have something that doesn't smell and that's better from a health perspective. It's very expensive to build sewers in these areas. And if you walk around, for instance, Sissimut in Greenland, you can find a gray water outlet in the wintertime like this or a gray water mound or in the summertime, you can see the gray water pipe discharging directly to the surface. So lack of good water and sanitary systems in the north cause health problems. That's been shown by many scientists. And we need to find systems that are both affordable and that can solve the problems. And that's a huge challenge. Are the current systems good? In Canada, they use ponds. And this is a sewage lagoon in Baffin Island. In Sisimut, this is excreta, discharged directly into the sea without any treatment. You, you might see an either duct there. Here it is. And uh, that's eating from these things. The animals, the fish, they like to be there. And you can shoot a lot of eider ducks there. And I ate eider ducks when I was in Greenland last time. Maybe they had been eating here. And what do they eat? What to accumulate in them? So the current handling, even in towns in Greenland, like Sisimut, 
many people still have these honey buckets and we have to look for better solutions but it's costly as I said and the uh, sewage is up to 160,000 US dollars per home in certain areas in northern Alaska and if you are going to build sewer pipes they need to be um, insulated you need a heating cable maybe you have to return pump them and the cost given here for Canada 6,000 Canadian dollars per meter that's huge costs so the centralized systems are very costly we have many examples of that here you see a wastewater pipe in Sissimut Greenman above ground to avoid it being hampered by the permafrost so if we look at centralized systems like we have further south the collection uh, system stands for up to 90 percent of the cost treatment is 10 to 30. I would think up in the north that the collection system would be more than 90 maybe and of course treatment might be expensive too so maybe it's an idea to think about can we do this de decentralized can we avoid this extreme cost of the piping of both water and sewerage and have decentralized systems decentralized treatment that's what I'm going to talk about later uh, in this lecture a little bit and later in the course we're giving and I'm going to look at infiltration systems and wetlands ponds and lagoons so-called natural systems and source separation conventional systems I will not cover in this lecture others will cover that but I will cover infiltration constructed wetlands ponds natural systems and source separation what is source separation that is that we take the excreta and we handle that separate from the rest of the water that we call gray water if we do that we can also recycle we can take the excreta we can mix it with organic household waste we can produce fertilizer bioenergy and subsequent it goes back and gives us food we can also more easily treat gray water back to usable water because it doesn't have all these constituents of uh, not as much pathogens and so on and if you look at the content urine is the most nutrient rich fraction the blue in the picture the brown is the feces and the yellow is the gray water the gray water doesn't contain contain much nutrients and if we look at volume the column to the right our excreta it constitutes a mere 1.5 liters and that in Norway we mix with 150 liters per day so that means in 1% of the wastewater we have more than 80% of what I call resources or nutrients that we can recycle and maybe you don't think we can recycle this in the north but we can so we also cover in this course health and risk so cultural issues development planning and economy these cross-cutting issues are often as important as the technical solutions and I say to my engineering students the engineering is a piece of cake for a good engineer but to know what to engineer to know what the people want and what they will maintain not the least yeah, that might be difficult and take time to find out unless we build something they will have they will not sustain it and then we also want to minimize the resource input the water the energy the materials we want to take the resources and use them recycle them 
that means we avoid to discharge them into the water and thereby we eliminate or minimize pollution and that's the definition of circular economy and that's also possible in the Arctic I will not tell you very much more about that now but uh, you'll find it on the website where this video is some more information on it thank you